Amen, amen. At this time of our service, we'd like to recognize any first-time guests. This is your first time visiting with us here at First Baptist. We'd like for you to please stand that we may welcome you and recognize you. Amen. Look like all of us are at home. So now that we've gone, I guess, through halftime of the service, we will continue to bless the Lord and in spirit and in truth. Be reminded of the uh, question that Pastor asked us on Wednesday night in Bible study. Pretty much it was said, do you believe? Is what I heard. Do you believe? Amen. Do you believe? And if the answer to that is yes, I believe. I think we're going to have a hallelujah good time for the rest of the day. Amen. Amen.
amen, amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's Psalm 51. That's a psalm for anyone that has a sincere desire to have God to clean you up so he can fix you up and move you forward. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, once again, for the privilege of being able to study your word. We confess, God, our unworthiness, but we express our gratitude. And we also express our need for you. We can't do anything good without you. So speak into our lives. Let our coming together on these Sundays and Wednesdays and however often as we gather, not become traditional and not just become a formality, but help us, O oh God, to understand that there is a divine purpose for our gathering today and each time we meet. And each time we meet as a congregation, God, we come believing and expecting you to meet with us. So it's not just about the people we see. It's about you, God, that we can't see with our physical eyes. But we know that you're here and we're asking, God, that you will lead us. Take your word, God. Cause it to transform us. Let us not just agree with it, but teach us how to live by it. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. We ask it, God, in Jesus' name, our Lord and our Christ. And the church said amen. 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 amen, amen. All right, let's go ahead and grab your Bible. This book is the Word of God. It was written with me in mind. It has the power to change my life. I have the power to receive it or reject it. What I do with it determines what it can do in me. It is God's gift to me for the abundant life. Amen. Jesus said in John 10 and 10 that the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And then John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So every time you get the word in you, you get more of God in you. And, the lit, and, and every time you refrain from getting the word in you, you refrain from getting God in you. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, or is God. Amen. And so this is God's word breathed upon by his Holy Spirit. And we want to look at Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse that uh, Pastor, uh, my friend Reverend Moses spoke from a couple weeks ago. Did an excellent job, so... So if I say everything he said, you just say amen. Amen. Because amen. <laughs> as he was preaching, I was writing. Amen. But I want to pick up, he picked up at verse 25. I want to pick up at verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want to talk about Christ's call to a life, or Christ's call and invitation to a life of rest. Christ's call and invitation to a life of rest rest. Let me begin by informing you that when Jesus uses the word rest in this particular passage of scripture, which he uses twice, he is not referring to the kind of rest that most of us deem as rest. He's not talking about being relaxed. He's not talking about a life without problems. He's not talking about a life without trials. In fact, when he speaks of rest, he's not even talking about primarily just eternal rest, but how to have rest in this world. How to be at rest and at ease amid the trials and the troubles and the tribulations of everyday life. 
In this particular passage of scripture, Jesus is still dealing with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and those who were religious fanatics. And they had imposed upon the people all of these laws, traditions, and they made it law. And so it was burdensome and it was grievous to the people. And as a result, people were burdened down. And I believe a lot of that's happening today. People are abandoning the church and all of the politics and all of the arguments and all of the fussing and fighting over foolish things that we say we're doing in the name of Jesus, but in reality, we're just stuck on tradition and we're stuck on stuff we want. And that's what was happening in this text. You had these Pharisees who had imposed all of these laws and added to the law, and Jesus was saying unto them, come unto me, I can, I can deliver you from that. The anxieties and the, and the stresses and the pains and the perils of everyday life. And so often Jesus uses this word, come. When Jesus used it with Peter, the Bible says when they were on the Sea of Galilee and the winds was boisterous and the waves were beating against the ship and the disciples became afraid and Jesus came walking across the waters. The Bible says when they saw him, they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus says, fear not, be not afraid, it is I. And Peter responds by saying, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come on the waters. And Jesus says, come. As Jesus was beginning his ministry, and he was walking by the disciples that he now has, and he saw Peter and John, James and his brother. When he saw them, he says, come, follow me. Oftentimes, Jesus will use this word come. In fact, the Bible says that he uses it when he says, if any man comes unto me, let him first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, here in this particular text, we see Jesus using this word again, but he's not using it in the same context in which they used it before. He's saying in essence to these who are troubled, to these who are burdened, to these who are pressed down, suppressed and oppressed, he says, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. In other words, I will, I will cause you to live a life of calmness. You might have trials in your life, you might have tribulations, you might have trouble, but your mind will be calm. You won't be depressed. You won't be suicidal. You won't feel like quitting every time you turn around. Because when I connect with you and you come to me, I'm gonna let the trials stay but I'm gonna give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Come. Come unto me all ye labor and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. So when we look at Christ's call and invitation to a life of rest, there are four things that I think Jesus helps us to understand in this particular call. First of all, when we look at this text in verse 28a, when Jesus says, come to me. The call to rest is an invitation to a new lordship under Christ. The call that he makes is a, is a call and an invitation to make him Lord over your life. So he says, come to me. You've been going to the church house, but you haven't come to me yet. You've taught Sunday school. you got a position as a deacon, a trustee, or a position in the body, or a preacher, but you've never come to me. You've come to, the, to your denomination affiliations, but, but drop all of that and come to me. 
See, the problem with most people who profess Christianity is that they've never really come to Christ. They've come to the church house, but they never come to the head of the church. They, they, they're associated and affiliated and even assent and agree with the things that the church does, but they don't know him for who he is. He says, I know you're religious, but I don't want you to be religious. I want you to be righteous. I want you to be refreshing. I want you to be revived on a daily basis. And you can't get that with religion because with religion, you got to work too hard. Come to me. You see, the call to rest is an invitation to a new lordship under the headship of Jesus Christ. That is to say that, that when Jesus calls us, there's a, there's a transferring of authority in your life. You're no longer submissive to those that you once used to be submissive to. There's a, there's a transferring fairing of authority and power and, and headship. And, and so now a uh, Satan is no longer your head. Now a uh, sin is no longer empowering you. Now yourself is no longer the head. Come to me. Make me the one that governs your life. Make me the one that decides what your day will be like. Make me the one that decides when you get up and lay down, when you go forward or go backward. Come to me. Be, let me be your Lord, so if I decide to use you like Job, you don't complain, you just go through it. Come to me. So if I decide, like Daniel, you gotta be thrown into a lion's den, you're with me so you're not bothered, because I can make the lions your pillars, come to me. Come to me, you might have fire in your life, but I can get into the fire with you, and the fire won't do you any harm. You've been religious, but you've never been righteous and you're burning down because you're trying to live good and you can't do it without me. And that's why you know of me. And that's why you know about me. And that's why you shout when you hear my name. But when you leave my sanctuary, you fall apart when something goes wrong. Come to me. It's a call to rest. It's an invitation to new lordship under the headship of Jesus Christ. And notice, first and foremost, as I got a lot of scriptures to give you today, uh, notice that the first thing that happens when you talk about this rest under the lordship of Jesus Christ, it is the denouncing of the lordship of Satan. Let me say it like this. If you're not serving Christ, you're serving Satan. There is no middle ground. And so when Jesus says, come to me, he says, literally, abandon Satan as your Lord and make me your Lord. In fact, any Bible that's, anybody that's ever studied the Bible and, and understand a little bit about the scriptures, then you understand that even Satan, Baal, is called the Lord of the flies. He, he's Lord, and he wants to be Lord of your life. But when you, when you come to Christ and when, when you make him your Lord and you come under his headship, what happens is you denounce Satan as your Lord. Look at Luke 22 and 31. Then we're going to go to Luke 4 and 6 through 8. We good? Take the Let's go. Luke 20, what did I say? Luke... Uh, Luke twenty two thirty one, 31. We can walk through it. That's why y'all always bring your Bibles. Amen. Amen. Luke 22, 31. And watch what it says. It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has demanded, and some context, says, or some scripture says, desire. He's demanded permission from God to sift you like wheat. In other words, Satan wants control over your life. He wants you to be religious, but not righteous. Go to the house of worship, carry your Bible, look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, but don't live like one. 
And the scripture says that Satan's desire for Peter, since Peter was a pillar of a, among his peers, is that he wanted to sift him because if you could kill the head or the leader, you could kill the tribe. Denouncing the lordship of Satan. Look at Luke 6, uh, Luke 4, 6 through 8. That's when Jesus was being tempted. And you got to understand that Satan wants to be your Lord. It says, and the devil said to him, somebody said the devil said, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomsoever I wish. In other words, Satan said, if you would just bow down and worship me, I'll make you happy. I'll give you more money. I'll give you more things. You live in a bigger house. Just be religious, but worship me. In other words, when you know that the Bible says do one thing, do the other. So you can feel like you're righteous, but you're still worshiping me. He says to Christ, all these things I'll give you if you just fall down and make me your Lord. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And that's what every believer ought to Every believer ought to memorize those words. Get behind me, Satan. In the name of Jesus. For the word says, Thou shalt worship the Lord God, and him only shall thou serve. You don't vacillate when it comes to certain things with Christ. You lose whatever it means to lose, but you don't ever give up your Christ. You don't ever give up your Christianity. He, said, he, said, he says it's a denouncing of the lordship of Satan. Look at Colossians 1 and 13. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Before you got saved, you used to serve him. And then transformed us, I transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved. So remember I said there's a transferring of power that has taken place. When we got saved, Satan lost his power and God took over through Christ. And so when Jesus says, come unto me, it is an invitation to a new lordship under the headship of Christ, which means first and foremost denouncing the lordship of Satan. But it also suggests denouncing the lordship of sin. Because the Bible tells us in Romans, the sixth chapter, in Luke 22 and 31, uh, Romans 6, 13 through 14, it tells us that sin has no business being dominant in your life. And we live in a day and time when the Bible prophesies that we're going to live in a day and time when people will not adhere to the truth of God's word. And we weaken it and we diluted it because you don't hear people preach about sin anymore. We've gone to the extreme. Back in the day, our foreparents, they preached about it so much that people call them doom and gloom preachers. But now we don't hear it at all, hardly. Because all we hear today is what God is getting ready to do for you. And I keep saying that when, when you got saved, God had already done everything he's going to do for you. The question is, not what is he going to do for you, what are you going to do for him? He saved you, you didn't save him. What's your response to salvation? All this stuff that they got preaching and teaching now, that if you do the ABCs of the, of the Bible, God will bless you, do this, you are blessed. But it doesn't promise you riches. It doesn't promise you wealth, but it does promise you his power. It's defeating the lordship of sin. And watch this, when we go back to, to uh, Romans, the sixth chapter, it says sin should not have dominion over your life. In other words, you ought to have power over the sin that tries to defeat you. You ought to be defeating the sin in your life. Turn that for, if you will. Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 13. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin. Now notice that. Do not go on presenting, which means you have the power to stop it or do it. You got a lot of people today who say, I just can't help it. That's a lie. You got a lot of people saying, well, the devil made me do it. The devil don't make you do it. The devil entices you to do it. He says, don't go on presenting, and he's talking to the church, the members of your body, your flesh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but you present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
And I say all the time, whatever you do, if you gotta look bad, make God look good. If you gotta suffer, if you gotta go without some pleasure, make sure that he don't go without his praise. For sin shall not be master over you. Say that with me. Sin shall not master my life. Why? Because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. You got to understand when he calls us, it's to defeat the lordship of sin in our lives. Why? Because sin is not supposed to be your master. You have a new master. So when sin shows up, you have the power to say no. That's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians 3 and 20 that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine through the power that works in us. You got to live like you got power. You got to wake up and remind yourself, I'm a man, I'm a woman of power. I'm not arrogant, I'm just confident that sin won't rule my life. Because whenever sin rules your life, sin ruins your life. We don't like to talk about sin because sin challenges you to change. It may, well, to talk about sin makes you examine yourself and see yourself in the light of God's word. The call to rest is an invitation to a new lordship under the headship of Jesus Christ. It's a transfer of power and authority, denouncing the lordship of Satan, defeating the lordship of sin. But watch this, denying the lordship of self. The reason so many of us are so weak as Christians, as believers, we won't get rid of self. Jesus helps us to understand in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone comes to me, remember the invitation is what? To come, but not just come and, and stay as you are. He says, if you come and you want to follow me, you must deny yourself first. Before you take up a cross, before you try to follow me, deal with you. You know why? Because the law, what, the, the, the first law of humanity is self-preservation. And when he becomes your Lord, you no longer are Lord of your life. Christians need to quit saying, if you've really been born again, you don't say, this is my life. Because once you get born again, it's not your life. You can't say I do what I want to do because it's not yours to do with. In fact, the Bible says if you're a part of the body of Christ, he owns you. And see, so many of us think we own ourselves. And that's why we can come every Sunday. That's why we can read the Bible. That's why we can show up for Bible study. But we can't get hell out of our homes and hell out of our lives because we will not submit and allow ourselves to deny ourselves. To deny yourself is the hardest thing to do. Because all your life, your ultimate interest and goal has to been to take care of you. And God says when you transfer that power, what you do is not only do you transfer it from the power of Satan and sin, you transfer the power from yourself. You say, I no longer govern my life. I go where you want me to go. I say what you want me to say. I live like you want me to live. I do what you want me to do. If they, if they curse me out because you said it, I bless them back. Lordship. So when Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden is Christ is called an invitation to a life of rest. That life of rest means coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ. But then secondly, it means the call to rest is an invitation to divine partnership with God in Christ. See, it's not just an invitation to a new lordship under the headship and, of Christ but it's, the, it's an invitation to a divine partnership uh, with God in Christ. Watch this, if you will. Come unto me, all ye who labor, who are overburdened, loaded down, spiritual anxiety, just tired. Anybody ever just get tired? Just tired. He said, come to me, come to me. And then watch what he says. He says, 
and I will give you rest. I will refresh in you. I will allow you to receive calmness in your life. But here's what you got to do to get it. You got to, watch this, take my yoke upon you. Now you understand the yoke was that which bound two oxes or oftentimes animals together. And what Christ is saying, just like those oxen are, our animals are bound together as that yoke and become accountable to each other and pulling forward together, he says, yoke yourself to me. See, you've been yoked to the world, you've been yoked in your relationship, you've been yoked with your money, you've been yoked with things. He says, now drop those yoke and yoke up with me. And he says, take. See, God doesn't force it. He doesn't make it happen. It's all a choice. So he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm going to get to that in a moment because when I look at this text, John 17, 21, says the call to partner with Christ is in total oneness and unity with him. When God calls us, he calls us so that we might be one with him. God doesn't want you to have a, I saw this sign that I think it was on a marquee once. God does not want weekend visits. He wants full custody. See, too many of us just give God weekend visits. We show up on Sundays. We show up on a, a midday sometimes. But God wants full custody of your life. And so he says that they may all be one. This is Jesus' priestly prayer. And his prayer is that first of all, we would be one. And then he says, even as you, Father, and I are in me, and I'm in you, that they also may be one in us. In other words, what God wants to do is make us a part of him. He doesn't just want you to be a church goer. That's why I quit saying you're going to church. You're not going to church. You're the church going to worship. Because once you get saved, you are the church. So he says, he says here that the goal and the desire of Christ is to be made one with him. One with God, the Father. One with God, the Son. One with God, the Holy Spirit. And one with everybody that's saved, regardless of what color they are, what age they are, and what classification we may classify them as. The call to partner with Christ in total oneness and unity with heaven and the body of Christ on earth. But then look at 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. As he has given us his divine power, or seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Watch verse 4. Notice this. For by these promises, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them, by what? By the promises, you may become what? Partakers of the divine nature of God. So the call to rest is an invitation to divine partnership with God through Christ, in Christ, and it's the call to partner with Christ in total oneness and unity with him and the body of Christ. But then secondly, the call to partner with God's divine nature to produce naturally. Because when you look at that text, that, that word to become partakers of the divine nature means to produce naturally what God would produce naturally. That means I naturally overcome troubles. I naturally overcome trials. I naturally love everybody. I naturally sacrifice myself. I naturally submit myself to his will. When you get saved and you become a partaker like Christ, you naturally do those things. And so you're careful about how you live because you understand that certain things you can't do because it's unnatural. I invite you to become a part of my nature. I don't just want to be above you. I want you to be in me and I want to be in you. I want us to be one. And that's not to say that he makes us gods, like some people teach. What it says is we're still human, but we got God in us. And so, so he says, here's what happens when, when you become partakers. Notice this. May become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. What did Paul just write? 
In, in, in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 13, let not sin have dominion over your life. Well, how do you escape it? By becoming partakers with the divine nature. Why? Because light and darkness can't dwell in the same place. And when you've been saved, and sanctified, you feel uncomfortable in places that God can't hang out in. And I'm not talking about going places where it's uncomfortable to preach and teach. I'm talking about going places where it's uncomfortable to hang out. So a lot of people say, well, Jesus hung out with sin sinners. He didn't hang out with sinners. He went to sinners. If he dwelt among them, he didn't dwell among them to do what they did. He dwelt among them to show them that they didn't have to live like that, but they could live like him. And so by these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promise, the promise to overcome everything. God is with you. And you got to remind yourself as a child of God, and if you have come to him based on this invitation, you have power to overcome everything. And you're able to do it naturally. In other words, he's saying, that's what, look at the word when Jesus used that word rest. And then you look at this text because all scripture complements each other. The script, the text in this word when he talks about the a partakers of the divine nature, it means to do what God has called us to do naturally. And you look at rest. In other words, it says don't nothing trouble you. It's easy to live for Christ when you become partakers of his divine nature. And then finally, look at Philippians 2 and 10. The call to partner with Christ in his sufferings, his death, and his resurrection. It says, so that every day of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. In that same passage of scripture, verse 5, it says, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself and made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a flesh, and became obedient even unto death and the cross. That suffering, God has called us to suffer for Christ's sake. American Christianity and 21st century Christianity says don't go through anything. The Bible says go through everything if a soul is at stake. That's why Paul says if eating meat makes my brother to stumble, I quit eating meat. We got this mindset, I don't care what nobody think of me. No, you ought to care. You should care. Because you never know if your actions will determine a person's going to heaven or going to hell. Christ cared. And so we don't do certain things. And I tell people all the time, even if I think something is not not necessarily wrong, when I'm in public, I don't do it if I even think it's completely right because I don't know who's watching me. Because if they misinterpret my actions, they, I could be a stumbling block to their salvation. The Bible says that it would be better for us to have a, a, a stone wrapped around our neck and thrown into the sea then to become a stumbling block. And let me say this for parents. Be careful how you live before your kids and grandkids. You don't want to be a stumbling block for them. Show them what it means to, to refrain yourself in the midst of a possible argument. Because they pick up everything. One of my grandbabies the other day said, uh, Paul, Paul, Let's play mommy and daddy. <laughs> I said, I can't play mommy and daddy with you. She said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. She was just persistent. I said, she said, now you be the daddy and I be the mom. I said, okay. So finally I gave in. She said, first thing she said, okay, let's kiss five times. I said, no, we got to stop this right now. <laughs> she said, no, you the daddy. I said, no, I just, I just, I'm no longer the daddy. I'm Paul Paul. <laughs> You gotta, be, you gotta be careful. Because what you don't think they see. Amen. Partner with Christ in his sufferings. And that is to say, it all ties in together because in order to suffer for him, it comes as a result of you denying yourself first. When Jesus uh, saved Saul and turned him into Paul, in chapter 9, I think it's somewhere around verse 16 in chapter 9 of Acts, 
he says to him, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. In 2 Timothy 3 and 12, it says, all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. Peter says in 1 Peter, the first chapter, somewhere around verse 4, he says, if you're suffering for unrighteousness, you need to deal with that. But if you're suffering for Christ's sake, that's what he's called you to do. So when he says, Make, be partner with me, don't just be partner for the blessings, be partners in the suffering. The call to rest is an invitation to lifelong discipleship under Christ. I'm almost done. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I, I, all the times that I read it, I've never paid attention to that. Because most of the time I've thought of it, I thought it says learn of me. He says learn from me. Why? Wow, that makes sense because a disciple is one who observes his or her master and then does what the master is doing. So he didn't say learn of me. You got to learn of him. But basically he says learn from me. See how I handle problems. Look at me and see how I deal with people who are always uh, 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 trying to create a problem or issue. Look at how I deal with haters. Look at how, how I deal with the hung, hungry and the homeless. And, and look at how I deal with pain and problems and pearls. He says learn from me. That is to say, a disciple is one who places Jesus above everyone and everything, literally in life. I think it's in Luke, the 14th chapter, verse 25 to 20, 35. I won't go through that, but it talks about if you don't love me more than you love your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your friend, your children, or yourself, you cannot be my disciple. Because a disciple is a pupil, a disciple is a follower, a disciple is one who imitates. That's why I say to Christians today, I don't understand people say I'm a disciple, I'm a follower of Christ, when even Jesus being the leader went to the sanctuary every, every time it was open practically. Jesus went to prayer service. He prayed all night long. We live in a day when folk don't believe in prayer until something goes wrong. The, the, the apostles prayed. When the Bible says in the, in the uh, book of Acts, the third chapter, that, that, that during prayer service time, they showed up. He said, don't just do what I say. He said, learn from me. Do like I do. Because if we ever learn how to stay before God on our knees, we can stand before the problems in the world. A disciple is one who places Jesus above everyone and everything else. And then a disciple is one who remains in Christ regardless of what happens. In other words, you don't vacillate. John 8, 31, it says, if you abide in me, remain in me. And that's what God calls us to do. Don't, don't quit every time it get hard. Don't, don't quit every time somebody walks out of your life. Don't quit every time something goes wrong. In fact, I say every time something goes wrong, stand strong, but don't give up. You remain in Christ because your salvation and your strength is not in the world, it's in the word. So you ought to stand flat-footed. And say that the storms rage and let the winds blow. But I'm determined to see. That's what our forebears used to say. What the end is going to be. I might have to go through some stuff that I didn't know was going to be on my plate or part of my destiny. But I've been saved. I've been sanctified. And I'm too satisfied to turn back now. Is there anybody in the house that can say I've learned and I'm learning from my master how to stand through the storms, how to stand through the rains, how to stand through the heartaches, how to stand through the pains. I've got a determination. I won't run, but I stand. Remain in Christ. But then it says a disciple is one who bears fruit for the glory of God. In John 15, it means that the Holy Spirit, that we don't, we don't bear fruit on our own. 
in our obedience to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit. And so God calls us to be obedient so that we can bear fruit to his glory. For those that are familiar with that passage, you know that's John 15, where it begins by saying, I'm the vine. My father's the husband, and you are the branches. And branches are designed to bear fruit. So as we branch out from Christ, the head of, our, of the body, and we're connected to him, we ought to be bearing fruit. As we obey Christ, then the Bible says the Holy Spirit will add to the church daily, not weekly. Which means by the time we get here on Sunday, because you've been bearing fruit and obedient to Christ during the week, somebody is coming as a result of your witness. And what they hear from the word is just a second confirmation to give themselves to Christ. A disciple is one who bears fruit for the glory of God. And then finally, come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, for take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, I'm humble, I'm understanding, I've been where you are. You got to understand, you got to, you got a priest that has gone through whatever you go through. And he says, I'm gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest. Now notice the, the first time you look at the word rest in verse 28, it literally talks about deliverance from mental anxiety and worries and oppression and all those things that trouble us. But here he says, you will find rest. That means your mind will be at ease and you won't have anything to trouble you because I'm with you. He says, for your souls, rest for your souls, your psyche. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what is Jesus saying? The call to rest is an invitation to a triumphant relationship in him. That is to say, as believers, no matter how much we go through, God has given us the ability to be victorious. Romans 8 and 31 says, if God be for you, who can be against you? The implication is that no matter what you go through, you were created and called by God to be victorious. Romans 8 and 37 says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. A conqueror is one who overcomes something or who conquers something. So he's saying, in essence, you've got some trials. You've got some troubles. You've got some situations that you don't like to be in. But you got to remind yourself as a disciple of Christ that God has called you to a life of rest. That is peace in the midst of the storm. He may not deliver you from the storm, but he will deliver your mind from the effects of the storm. In other words, you can walk through those things and you can still hold your head up and you can still have a genuine smile on your face and you can genuinely love other people who will not genuinely love you back because you know something that they don't know and you're connected to somebody that they're not connected to. I stop by to tell somebody, I've got the peace of Christ in my mind and the Bible says, thou who keeps the mind on him. God will give him perfect peace. Isaiah 26 and 3. Perfect peace. Storms are raging. Perfect peace. Trouble is rising. Perfect peace. Folk walking out of your life. Perfect peace. Why do you have it? You have it because of him who led the way when he hung Bled and died. He had perfect peace. When they took him from judgment hall to judgment hall. And they called him everything. But a child of God. He never lost sight of who he was. Or what his assignment was. They took him before a judge. They accused him falsely. They told him to defend himself. But the Bible said he never said a mumbling word. Cause when you know you're right, you ain't got to prove you're right. The Bible said they stripped him of his clothing, put on a purple robe. They put a reed in his hand. 
they made mockery of him, said prophesy, but he never said a word because he understood his destiny. Had he got out of character, you and I wouldn't be saved today. They nailed him to a cross. They hung him high. They stressed him why. They talked about him. They wagged their heads. They said, come down if you're the son of God. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He never lost himself. He didn't get caught up in his emotions. They took him down. They put him in a grave. But on the third day, early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. I stopped by to tell somebody, you can be a disciple. Just come, come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest, rest, rest from your weariness, rest from your worries, rest from your trials. Just come, come to me and it will be all right. Stuff can fall down, but you will stand tall. Stuff can fall apart, but you will hold it together. Just come. And when you come to him, you're not worried about the economy. And not just because you know God will provide, but if I got to go on the bridge, he didn't promise me a house. He didn't promise me a bank account. He didn't promise me a bunch of clothes. He didn't promise me a new car. But he said, Lo, I'll be with you, even to the end of the age. I don't know about you, but that's better than money. Because if the Lord is with me, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Is there anybody in the house that can say, I'm so glad that the Lord is with me. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I've got joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. I've got peace that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. I'm not faking it when I smile. I'm happy. I'm happy. Is there anybody that's happy? Not because of what's happening, but because what has happened on the inside of you. I'm happy. The songwriter said, I see because I'm happy. I see because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. If he looks out for a little bird, I know his eyes are watching over me. It's already, it's already, it's already all right. It's already all right. So don't you weary, don't be weary. And Mary, don't you weep. God's got this thing. He's got it. But come to him. All ye that are burdened down, whether it's religion or just worldliness at home, come to him. Make yourself his disciple. And he will give you rest to your soul. Storms around you. But your rest is in your soul. Nothing bothers you because you know who's in control. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise, all the honor and your glory. We strive, God, to teach your word so that we just won't have a bunch of hollering and shouting, but we have some substance to fight with, some scriptures to stand on. Because if we stand on your word, we can stand in the world. And so God will engrave your word into our hearts and our minds until your word becomes a living reality. And we'll give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. It might be somebody here today who has not received Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior. And you've been troubled, you've been tempted on every side. And you're like Daryl Coley, you just can't wait till Sunday come. 
so that you can hear a word and get relief. But I want you to know when you stay intimate with Christ, you don't have to wait for Sunday. Sunday becomes your day of jubilation. Sunday becomes your day of expressing your appreciation for what God has already done. So you don't have a personal relationship with him today. I want to extend you to come. The Bible says come. Come to me, all you that labor. If you're burdened down, maybe you're saved, but you're burdened down, going through something. Need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. I want to rededicate your life. Come. Come to him. Don't be afraid. Don't let your pride stand in the way. Come as you are. And you've heard me say, if you come as you are, he loves you too much to leave you as you are. We serve a real God. We serve a true Christ. And God wants you to have a peace in your life. He wants you to have that joy in your life. So you don't have to fake it. So you can be real with this thing. If that's you today, would you come? Man, woman, boy, girl. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, in the cross. It's not too late. Just be. Not for a little while. Seal. Yes, Lord, yes. There is rest, there is rest. It's not too late. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There are, quickly before we take up our offering, there's a couple announcements that I need to make. And let me uh, pull this up real quickly so I can see what it says. Uh, well, I just missed one, so that's... <laughs> We're asking that the parents would please bring their youth 6th to 12th grade Alpha Choir rehearsal starting on January the 25th at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Richmond Center. Brother Jerome Barber will be directing them with the assistance of Sister Rika Claycomb and Tawana Shakelin. Bible study will follow afterwards. If you have any questions, please contact Tawana Shakelin, 439-4788.